he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father. Welcome back to 21 Patriarch. It is my honor to introduce to you for the very first time, Elliot Hulse, first time for me anyhow. Elliot is a father of four, a husband of his high school sweetheart, a strong man, a strength coach, uh, influence for good on the whole on social media, a lover of men, a friend of men, a great guy. Give him your attention and give him your applause. Welcome, Elliot. Thanks again. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Anthony, for inviting me to come up here and speak at the Patriarch Convention about the state of the American father. And so we could look directly at the father, and the world has done a lot of critique on the father. But what we're actually going to do is step back for a moment and look at the context of the father. If you really want to understand something, you've got to see it in its living uh, environment, right? Was it Jane Goodall who wanted to study the gorillas in the mist, right? She had to go and live amongst them, see where they lived and what surrounded them to better get an understanding of why they do what they do. So what we're going to do is we're going to study the father in the context of the world that we currently live in. So we're going to explore a few different elements of the context of the state of the American father, beginning, of course, with wives and women. There are no uh, fathers without a woman. Fathers require women. Wives are required for husbands and for families to flourish. We need women. So we have to consider the state of women if we're going to understand the state of the American father. We also want to understand the state of the family as it relates to the father, children. We also are going to consider the community, and community is a bit unique in this day where we've pulled back from local community. We've pulled back from the family, as you'll see in my, my talk later on. But we have almost a, uh, what I would like to say is a digital community, and it's strange. We'll explore that, what it means for the state of the American father, uh, and bringing it back into a local community. We also, of course, we're going to be talking about the state of the American father. We're going to talk about America. We've got to talk about the country. We've got to talk about the culture. We've got to talk about the world in which we exist. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the Father. This refers specifically to God the Father, religion, as it relates to our spiritual life. This is also concomitant with our physical fathers, our real fathers. What is our relationship as men to our fathers and the Father? And so if we're going to be taking a look at all this, we have to recognize that there is a contrast or perhaps a opposing force to that which is intended for the American father. And so we have to consider the enemy. In a world where we like to see everything as flat and even and equal and e egalitarian, there's a lot of hesitance to point out who the enemy is. I think I once heard that if you want to know who your enemy is, you look at who you can't talk about, what you can't mention, and you'll see that the enemy is a, uh, a weaponizer of words, and you'll see that through my talk. We are in a war. It's an old war. It's a war that's been going on since dirt was invented by God. It's a war between good and evil. Now, of course, once again, in a world where nobody wants to judge or label because of the topsy-turvy screw, screwing of our minds, I think a more resourceful way of describing this for the postmodern mind is the contrast between, or the battle between, order and chaos. God has established an order on this planet for men, for women, for families, for community and country, and it's called patriarchy. So we're going to see how our patriarchy is holding up in a world that has Satan's minions chanting, tear down the patriarchy, smash the patriarchy. How are we holding up physically in this spiritual battle? 
Because everything that we experience physically, everything that we see, hear, touch, and smell, everything that we deal with on the daily, on this degenerate planet, is manifest, is a manifestation of a spiritual reality. And you know this is true. Because if you consider the war as it's unfolded in this day, post-2020, you can see that it's not only an attack on our bodies. A hundred years ago, we had the two world wars. It was a carnal battle, physical battle, bloody battle with bombs and bullets. Today, though, the battle has seeped in. It's more insidious. It is a battle for our minds. It's a battle for our emotions. It's a battle for our bodies. And the unifying force of that which is spirit and God. So we have to point out, we have to consider, we have to objectify this hidden enemy by giving him a name. And we know it's Satan. It goes a little bit further than that, though, because Satan is a spiritual entity, is uh, perhaps an idea. Uh, maybe we don't see the devil in the daily, but there are minions. There are henchmen. There are men that are workers of iniquity that seek to destroy God's kingdom on earth, the patriarchy. And they are conduits through which Satan does his dirty work, as you'll see. On the left there, you see Antonio Gramsci. On the right is Mark Lucas, or John Lucas. I'm just going to read a little bit of a quote from these gentlemen and their intentions. Lucas and Gramsci had taught in the early uh, 1900s, communism is impossible in the West until both Western civilization and Christianity were destroyed. This was the main aim of what they coined to be cultural Marxism. If we back up for just a moment and we consider the spiritual battle, an interesting note to, uh, to bring up and something to consider in the light of the situation that we're in, on October 13, 1884, Pope Leo XIII, one of the last real popes, had a vision where he heard, overheard Satan ask God, for the next 100 years to have dominion over mankind. According to the Pope, Satan was granted the time to test mankind in these unknown ways, in many unknown ways. Pope Leo fainted after he heard the conversation between God and Satan, and he personally composed the St. Michael prayer, which is said every day after the Mass. So here we have Antonio Gramsci and we have uh, Mark Lucas, both the founders of, or, or the, the fruit of the October, November revolution or the Bolshevik revolution where the Russian hierarchy was toppled by revolutionaries. The problem was that although they were able to succeed in Russia and they worked their iniquity west towards Germany, uh, they realized that it was practically impossible to topple the west with a social revolution or with a political revolution, particularly in America, because the working class started to thrive and was becoming a part of the middle class. And so with uh, capitalism, Americans were fairly happy. It was very difficult for them to sort of impose this idea of communism. A um, little bit more about these fellas, if I can get this to work. Lucas, quote, the great obstacle to a Marxist regime was Western civilization itself. I see the revolution and destruction of society as the only solution. A worldwide overturning of values cannot take place without the annihilation of old values and the creation of new. So you understand that this was the demise, this was the plan, this was the idea behind cultural Marxism. It was a subversion of the culture by corrupting the minds, the hearts, the emotions of the people as opposed to physically oppressing them. Antonio Gramsci goes on to say, 
the West would have to be de-Christianized by any means, particularly that of the long march to the institutions. What he meant by that was taking their time, 100 years, taking their time in order to infiltrate all aspects of all higher institutions throughout the West, particularly in America. The culture must be the new battleground. All cultural barriers to the acceptance of Marxism must be removed or reconfigured according to Marxist principles, starting with the traditional family, the churches, the arts, the cinema, theater, literature, science, history, media, education, and so forth. So you might ask yourself, how is it that these guys who have this grand idea of a worldwide utopia by toppling the patriarchy and scrambling the culture in order to rebuild it in their likeness and image rather than the image of God? Well, in 1933, or I'm sorry, the 1923, the, in Frankfurt, Germany, with the primary goal of destroying traditional Christian culture in Germany, when Hitler came to power in 1933, they fled to the United States uh, since every single member of this school was not only a Marxist, but a Jew. So this is the Frank's, Frankfurt School. Uh, with the help of Columbia University, the school reestablished itself in New York City and changed its focus from destroying traditional Christian culture in Germany to destroying it in the United States. They realized that the American working class would not leave, lead a Marxist revolution because it was becoming part of the middle class. Who then would lead this revolution? So what they had to do is they had to find or create and foment disturbance between the people. America was doing fairly well at this time. People didn't want to revolt. Patriotism was high. So they said, who then would lead the revolution? They sifted through our society looking for disaffected people. And in 1953, they settled on an idea of a coalition made up of blacks, students, feminist women, and homosexuals. They also went on to create something called critical theory, something we're hearing a lot more about here today. By crossing Marx with Freud, they invented something called critical theory, which involved making the most destructive criticisms of every possible cultural norm in order to destroy the current social order. For example, men are oppressors and women are the oppressed. And they used the media to pour out this contempt. In the institutions of higher education, the cultural Marxism of the Frankfurt School was commonly known as multiculturalism or political correctness. So there we have the agenda and then we have the tool by which the American culture could be subverted. Let's just take for a moment uh, a view at some of the main aims of the Frankfurt School, which by the way, if I can back up for a moment, my entire talk at last year's 21 convention revolved around the research that I've been doing on this particular topic and I go much deeper. But for sense of time, we're just going to look at a few of the main aims of this Frankfurt School, and then we can take a look at how it relates to the state of the American father. Number one was the emptying of churches. So in order for a communist regime in, to unfold in the West, they understood that they needed to chop the head off, God the Father. The West was considered Christendom. And they knew that they needed to de-Christianize the West, according to Gramsci, in order to subvert the people and make the state their god. Bella Dodd, well-known revolutionary, has boasted in saying that in the 1950s, they were able to get 11,000 of their men in the seminaries. Essentially, what they did is that they found revolutionaries and homosexuals and put them into the seminaries of the school, uh, of the uh, the church. And so much of what we see unfolding in terms of pedophile scandals in the church were planted, it was created, it was made such by putting these men into the seminaries, making them priests, making them uh, into the spiritual leaders of the people, but then corrupting them as a result. It's not arbitrary that there were so many homosexual priests. Number two, declare woman to be an oppressed class and men to be the oppressor. Lenin is known for saying that in order for a revolution to take fold, you need to have the women on board. There are many different tools and techniques that have been used in order to subvert women, in order to corrupt them, correct their minds, and turn them against men, one of which is this 
idea of oppressed and oppressor. And we'll see this as a theme throughout their practice in order to create strife, create trouble, create separation, and chaos in our culture. Abolish the differences between educations of boys and girls. If we're looking at the fruits of their practices starting in the 1950s, we get to this place today where we now find that men and women are practically depolarized. We've been taught that men should behave more like women, women should behave more like men, and as a result, relationships aren't working. So we know that the work that they're doing is working, because our lives are not. Encourage the breakdown of the family. The, the, the number two, number three, and number four, you can almost pinpoint under the category of feminism. The ability to divorce, uh, the ability to live promiscuously, the ability to destroy the family through these principles uh, are paramount to the school's agenda. Encourage, and these are stated agendas. I'm not making this up, this is what they wanted to do in order to uh, subvert the culture. Sorry, these, this clicker is a little sticky. All right. I should probably memorize this stuff, right? It, it ain't working. So, okay, encourage the breakdown of the family. I think I just need to get closer. Teaching sex and homosexuality to children. So, recently I saw a clip from a children's program that I remember watching when I was a kid called Muppet Babies, right? And so, Gonzo was always a little weird. If anybody remembers Gonzo, he's the guy with the long nose. Little wacky, little weird, but apparently in the new woke version of Muppet Babies, Gonzo wants to be a girl. He wants to wear a dress. And so we have four-year-olds now having to confront this idea of transgenderism. One of the ways they've confused the genders as well as uh, the fruit of their intention of teaching sex and homosexuality to children. Now it's all the rage to be a rainbow person. But back in the day, it was something that was considered unheard of. Well, when you have drag time, drag queen story time, and Lil Nas X, and Gonzo going Gonzo wanting to wear a dress, you see that their plans are working. Create dependency on the state or state benefits. And so this supports feminism. It also supports the breakdown of the family. It supports the degradation of our culture through the dependence on the state, through handouts and such. And since 2020, we can see exactly how far they can go, where there are stimulus packages and money being sent through the mail to everybody with a heartbeat. And as a result, the economy is taking its hits. This is a byproduct of their plan to create dependency on the state and state benefits, as opposed to the father and the family. Controlling and dumbing down the media. Has anybody ever seen that clip that Joe Rogan put out just a few days ago, where he pieced together news clips uh, as it were being presented across the board of all media outlets? And every single one of them began with, brought to you by Pfizer. Brought to you by Pfizer. We want to thank our sponsor, Pfizer. Brought to you by Pfizer. So when we consider the dumbing down and controlling of the media and how it's unfurled its demise on our people, we can see that it's the pharmaceutical companies, it's the processed food manufacturers, it's the, the state with their cronies controlling our minds and our bodies. The promotion of excessive drinking, because a drunk man is a stupid man. And he will make bad decisions. Huge immigration to destroy identity. So when you change your, a person's mind and a heart, particularly a man, to be a bit more effeminate than is natural for him, boundaries begin to dissolve. And one of the weaponized words that the Marxists have used is this idea of inclusion, and that there should be absolutely no boundaries, and that everybody should gather together and build like we're in the Tower of Babel. Well, it's not working. Uh, it's, not, it's not working out very well for us, 
It's working out real well for them. This is crazy. It's working out real well for them because as a result of the influx of, well, you know, the open border or the southern, uh, there is a changing of cultural identity. There is a perverting of patriarchal pride and, and uh, patri patriotism. In the light of the intention of the Marxist and the Frankfurt School, we can now take another look at the state of the American father. As it relates, there is no father for the American father because the West has been dechristianized. Essentially, most of us have become atheists. And whatever religion is left is sort of a therapeutic, sort of feel-good kind of religion that more resembles paganism than Christianity. Wives and women. We can see that through the subversion of the family and the culture that relations between men and women are not very good. The children have been essentially given over to the state through the media, through, through the education, all of these institutions that that long march that Gramsci was talking about and how they impact the lives of our children. Okay, community essentially destroyed. Why? Because we no longer rest on our neighbors. We no longer rest on our counties. We no longer rest on the people that are actually in our physical environment. Instead, we depend on a national state. We depend on a consolidated power-hungry monster that is seeking to involve itself and control every aspect of our lives. There is no community. And as far as country is concerned, there is a growing sentiment of hate towards America, towards our fatherland, towards patriotism, and towards my ability to get this conversation done. So to back up just a minute and kind of just take a big picture view of what I'm talking about, in terms of the state of the American father, we are perverted, subverted, and controlled and manipulated by Satan. And guess what? He is winning. Through his minions, the Marxist, we have seen the degradation of our relationship to our father, relationship with women, children, and family destroyed, community non-existent, and pure hatred in our country for our own culture. So I ask you, how is it that the American father is to do his job given the circumstances or the context in which he finds himself? Now, I'm not blaming women, children, the community, and the state. I'm not even blaming Satan for all this, as easy as that would be, right? Who we need to look at in terms of our lack of protection of these things is ourselves. There's enough nitpicking and picking on and degradating the masculine in our culture. It's not my intention here, but my intention here is to show you exactly where we drop the ball. Make no mistake about it, men, we are slaves. And like I said before, this is a spiritual battle, so we no longer find ourselves in these physical chains that maybe we once did. But we are absolutely 100% slaves to the state, slaves to women, slaves to our children, slaves to a evil sentiment that seeks to destroy us, mainly because we lack self-control. We lack sexual self-control. We lack the ability to take the most powerful energetic force in our body and the ability to direct it towards building God's kingdom on earth, and instead, our minds, our bodies are locked up in lockstep with a plan that is not of our best interest. According to E. Michael Jones in Libido Dominande, Sexual Liberation and Political Control, the elites have known for a very long time that if they can Make a, man, make a man a slave to his sexual instincts that he's that much more easily manipulated. When a man is steeped in sexual sin, he will excuse all of the sin around him because of the guilt and shame that he holds. So th there is a plan 
that has unfolded over the past 100 years to make us slaves to sex and thus lose our power as patriarchs in this world. We've got to consider, and so what I'll offer is just a few things that we can do a much better job in with regard to taking back our sexual power, taking back our strength, taking back our ability to lead this world the way God intended, us for, intended for us. Straight out of Jesse Lee's handbook, I love the way he says this, it's about fornication. This is not a po positive, uh, 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 popular topic. This is not something people like to hear you say. I can only point this, to, point this out because I've seen the deleterious effects of fornication having sex out of wedlock. One of the things that men in this atmosphere particularly tend to complain about is the promiscuity of women. We all know that promiscuity defiles your future marriage bed. We know that by the scientific studies that have shown us that a woman who has had multiple sexual partners, too many sexual partners, uh, which like really any more than your husband is too many, has a harder time pair bonding. Now, we can point fingers all we want, well, who are these women having sex with? And as a result of us giving away our sexual power to these women and working towards their demise and corruption, we then lose ourselves. One of the biggest issues that I even heard uh, Steve talking about is choosing the wrong woman. We marry the wrong woman, particularly because we tolerate bad behavior from these women because we're having sex with them. Make no mistake about it, no matter how tough you think you are, when you start having sex with a woman, you put on sex goggles. I've seen it happen time and time again where a man is with a woman that is, has more red flags than a Chinese parade. That's who's that, Coach Adams, right? More red flags, but he cannot see it. Why? Because she has him literally right by his organs. We give our power away by accepting their, their their manipulation, their openness, which then becomes a manipulation. I am of the opinion, and I will stand by and fight for the ideal of saving oneself for marriage. If we're wanting to win back women, win back our families, win back our country, we've got to stop giving our sex away. We're slaves to it. And it's not just with women, it's also with pornography. Stop watching porn. According to Libido Dominandi, uh, E. Michael Jones states that when the Israelis wanted to take over Palestine, one of the very first things that they did when they came in was they littered the entire cities with pornographic material. Literally, just papers, magazines, pornography. So they scattered pornography over the cities. Then, the next thing they did is they went in and they took over four, three of the four television stations and broadcast pornography 24 hours a day. So these people were on lockdown, right? And this was back in the, what, 1980s? They were on lockdown, we know what that means now, all of us. And they were forced to stay home and stare at a screen that they would be hopefully getting news from, but instead, porn. Think about 2020 lockdowns and Pornhub. There's a reason why, because you make the men very weak, you make them very passive, you corrupt the women, you destroy the culture. They don't need to use bombs and bullets. They use sexual license and pornography in order to enslave us as men and as fathers. Part of the problem is that sex seems so fun. It, we get a sense of pride from it. We think that we're doing something and that we're big men because we can have sex or have this false sense of pride when we're rubbing off to some porn. But make no mistake that every time we do that, every time we give our power away, the enemy is winning and he's smiling and he loves it. I'm not up here trying to make your life miserable, but things aren't working out really well and it has a lot to do with what we're choosing to do with our dicks. Stop being effeminate. The word effeminate essentially means an aversion to doing what's hard, stop fucking, and a, an aversion to doing what's hard, an attachment to that which is pleasurable. Think about all of the activities. Think about all the vices. Think about all the things in our lives that make us effeminate. Addiction to media, addiction to games, addiction to 
women, addiction to food, addiction to drugs, addiction to alcohol. These are all weapons. They're all tools used to what? Subvert your power and make you a slave. We've got to take a good look at ourselves, guys. The problem in the West, which was very different than the Bolshevik Revolution and the revolution in the East, because it's one revolution that rose there and has, has you know, made its way West, is that back then, in that place, they had to do it with force. They had to take over and corrupt the people by force, political force, bombs and bullets. Today, we willingly lay back and allow them to step over us. Why? Because comfort. Well, I don't want to give up my iPhone. Well, I don't want to give up Amazon. I don't want to give up Google and Gmail and YouTube. I don't want to give up all the creature comforts that keep us, what? Trapped, slaves, to our effeminacy. It's our fault. we got to start saying no. I know it sounds hard because it's like, what is Elliot saying? Is he telling us that we should have miserable, sex sexless lives? No. I'm saying we could have that much more if we had self-control. Those are base things. Those are easy things. Those are things that keep us heavy, that keep us ball and chained. They feel good, though, and that's why it's so insidious, and that's why Satan uses it as his tools. And then finally, we got to take, look, the first three are about what not to do. We got to take back our power. I've said enough about that. We got to turn our sexual energy into generativity. But we got to take responsibility for the mess that we're in. We are in, a, we are in a war, men, and we're not woke up enough to realize it. We are in a war right now, and we haven't picked up our swords. We're in a war right now, and we haven't even mounted a defense. Make no mistake about it, I said spiritual war, which can kind of sound a little out there. But the non-conventional warfare that we're experiencing on our soil by a biological attack from a communist enemy is proof that you can't see it. Where's COVID? I don't see it. You're not going to see the war. It's not going to be written on the wall. The media ain't going to tell you about it. We're right smack in the middle of it. Now, I said 100 years, right? God, at the end of the age, will promise Satan a hundred years to what? Create that separation between the wheat and the chaff. This is our time. This is our calling. We're here for a reason because we get to choose. Are we a part of the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of God? Our fathers. We're talking about the state of the American father, but if you can't even look at and confront your relationship with God the Father, there's no hope. The West was built in one on Christendom not communism. So we got to take responsibility. And that might mean that we got to make some really tough decisions. That might mean we have to get very uncomfortable. That might mean we have to set ourselves apart and turn away from the world and do things a bit differently. Luckily, we have tradition. Luckily, we have the patriarchs of the past. Luckily, we have a blueprint and a pattern in the Father to show us exactly what kind of a world we can build. I even think in terms of that word father when we talk about the founders of our nation, our culture, our country. Fathers, once again, the founding fathers who put forth a document that Satan has all but took a shit on right now. Through mandates, which doesn't mean anything. So here we are. The state of the American father with a vision of what it would look like if we took back our power. Chaste men, strong men, stoic men, men that deliberately set boundaries, men that stand up and say no, even if it means that people will hate us. Men like the men of old, the patriarchs. That's possible. And if we could just start to mount that attack, we could start to mount that defense against our own demise by turning away from sin, we might have some hope. It begins with us. But as the fathers, and by the way, the word patriarchy literally means father rule. As the fathers, as the leaders, as the men, patriarchs, in our homes, in our communities, and in our countries, if we take back our power, 
we might be able to make some effective change in these other five areas, so much so that the enemy would cower and run in fear. But it's not going to be easy. I'm going to put forth some suggestions, ideas, things that maybe we can get behind and agree upon, and maybe put some wheels on and move forward with as a means to win back our world. So let's take a look first at women, right? That's the basic building block of everything that we're doing here. It started with Adam and Eve, man and woman. We can't take a look at community. We can't look to take a look at children. Can't take a look at country if we can't take a look at our partners in all this, our helpmates in all this, our wives and our women. So I have a few suggestions. Number one, we have to hold women accountable. Now, it requires that we hold ourselves accountable first. Men prefer chaste women for wives. Now, if you want whores, then that's what you're going to get if we keep doing the things that we've got. But if we want to restore the family, we want to restore community, we want to be at one with our fathers, we have to expect women to live up to a standard that we set for them. Prefer purity. Prefer women who don't have a track record for making bad decisions, i.e., single mothers. Prefer women who honor their flesh by not marking it with tattoos. Just my opinion. Honor women that honor femininity over feminism. Teach women what we want. Show them what we want, not by speaking it, but by our preferences. Learn to say no. That's the hardest part. It started with Adam when his wife tempted him. He said, sure, babe. Happy wife, happy life. Well, it's got us in the mess that we're in. Be willing to be without them. This whole idea that every man's supposed to be with a woman, I think is actually pretty new. There was a time when they were confirmed bachelors. These are just men that did MGTOW before MGTOW was a thing. There were men that dedicated their lives to reverence of the Father. We don't have as many monks as we once did. But if we're not going to be a monk, we got to go for marriage. That's my opinion. It's monk or marriage. And if we're going to get involved with women and have marriages, we have to expect that they're going to behave like wives. And there's all kinds of association with that that's real tough to swallow because of the subversion of our public schools, the bringing together of boys and girls in the classroom, and the oppressor oppressed lie that Satan has been telling them. I could continue to go on, but women are happier when they're under the mantle of a strong alpha male. They don't want to be in control. They don't want to keep killing their babies. They don't want to keep destroying our families through divorce. But they can't help themselves if we're weak and we don't stand up and we stop tolerating it. Everything from chastity to abortion, we have to say no. It's not arbitrary. These aren't up for debate. My opinion is as long as we continue to go along with evil, evil will gladly destroy our lives. And the, painter I pitch, the picture I painted before is clear evidence that our lives are not going the way we want them to. Take back marriage is number two. I'm a fan of marriage. I believe that a man and a woman are healthier throughout their lives if they come together and become one flesh. We're actually two halves of a whole. It, we're better together. Of course, there's a possibility for family as a result. But when the state owns our marriages, through marriage license, when the state owns our children through social security, when the state has all of its fingers, all of its tendrils and nasty fucking claws in every aspect of our lives, they corrupt it. The reason why marriage is, part of the reason why marriage has been corrupted is because the state has decided that it's in their best interest, their best interest is absolutely their best interest to destroy the family and make the women and children dependent on the state. They don't need us. They don't want us. We got to stop playing their game for their bullshit tax benefits. Now, if there are any lawyers in this room, 
or any statesman watching this video, I propose, please reach out to me and let me know if you'd be willing to put forth some legislation, some rule in the game where we can take back marriage and let it be between a man, a woman, and our creator, not the government. Why is the government involved in so many aspects of our life? Why do I need a license for everything I do? Why do they need to be involved with the type of family I choose to create? There's a good reason why. Because when the women and the children are dependent on the state, the man is degraded and dejected and useless, like we've become. Abolish divorce, marry once and once for all. These make-believe Brady Bunch families do not foster an environment where children will thrive. Also, it perverts in the child's mind what a family should look like. And of course, in our world where Satan has taken his fullest measure of through Marxist ideals and has created all kinds of perversions of the family. There's one kind of family, and that's it. I hate to burst anybody's bubble or to rub it in anybody's face who's had mistakes. Hey, we're swimming in this shit. It's hard not to make mistakes. I'm only blessed to have been preserved, saved, I think, the grace of God. But we have to go into it. Like I said, either we're, gonna, we're not going to do it or we're going to do it. Divorce, we know, is about 60% of the families. We also know that in certain states, 90% of the divorces are initiated by women. Higher standards for our women, taking back our marriage. So it's between us and the government has nothing to do with it. Abolishing divorce makes marriage and family stable. There's no out. And I know that's scary for people who believe that all of life is lived in this flesh. Only a spiritual people can make the sacrifice in that way to become one flesh with a woman and stay that way and raise that family. Only a spiritual people, according to our founding fathers, I believe it was Madison, said could maintain a republic. That's why we had to get God out of our lives so that they could destroy the family, destroy the republic. We're there, guys. You know, I said this to my kids the other day because I'm in a constant culture battle with my children as well, right? They see TikTok. That when a, you've heard this before, and I just want to use it as an example for where we are right now with the frog in the boiling pot. It's taken 100 years for that frog in that pot and that slow increment turning up of the heat to where we are right now, we're boiling to death. And most of us don't even know it. We have no idea that we're bound for hell. For the, hey, what's the big deal? Hey, just accept everything. Hey, you only live once. Hey, you're effeminate. We're acting like weak men as a result. Honor God in your marriage. A lot of times men hear this idea of having authority in your family. It sounds like a good idea, right? because it's our natural state, it's our natural place. It comes through authority that is given us from above. You want a woman to respect you, you respect your father. You want your children to respect you, you respect your father. All power comes from above, and there's an order. Love comes from God to Christ, to man to child, to woman to child. If we have no head, we have no authority. I'm not here to proselytize. I'm not here to save anybody. I'm not here to change anybody's mind. But I'm pointing out what works, contrast to what we got, which don't work. If to destroy the West, you de-Christianize it. To build it back up, you re-Christianize it. It's the only way, fellas. Patriarchy is order. What we have now is chaos. Patriarchy comes from above. Honor God in your marriage. So we can have a nice time, men and women. We can have nice relationships. We can have a good life together. I'm not here to brag simply because I know that I'm, a, I'm just as degenerate as the rest of y'all. I've made bad decisions in my life. And I can only say that the grace of God has given me leeway to present this message because he's given me 
good wife, a good family, a good life. I couldn't speak with this kind of conviction, but I didn't do it myself. <laughs> Lord knows. So we can make this work again. We can make families work again. We can make marriage work again. This is my dream. This is, this is God's dream for us. Let's move on to family and children. Make children respectful again. It's not even that hard. It really isn't. But when we don't teach the children the small things, the easy things, the little things like please and thank you, say hello, we are giving them over to the culture. And as you understand by the demise of the of Frankfurt School, they want the state and the media to teach your children how to behave. If you watch how the children behave in the media and in the movies and what they teach our children is the right way to relate to your parents, the right, right way to relate to authority, the right way to relate to God, you'll see that these children are going to be completely lost. Small things by teaching your children that your mother and father are worthy of your respect. It's not an easy thing, I understand, in our Miley Cyrus world, where the dad's a big, dumbling, bumbling fool, right, and the mom's a tyrant. Remind them of the sacrifices that you make as a father because otherwise they'll take it for granted. Remind them that your mother has given her body to bring you forth. Remind them that they're here because of our love for each other and our love for you. Remind them that you don't have anything that doesn't come through me. Now, of course, the media and the government want the children to believe that at the drop of the dime, they can call up whatever bureau that they want and rat on your parents about not following the cultural standard for things. But we gotta stay in our ground and we gotta know what's right and we gotta show them and teach them. Simple things though, guys, right? I'm talking kinda high and mighty right now, a lot of philosophical ideas, but teach them to say thank you. Thank you. And you know how you do, you, how you do that? You get your, you and your wife demonstrate. Every meal my wife serves me on my, table, I thank her. They hear me thank her. And my wife reminds my children to thank your father. In fact, before I got here, I was on the phone with my wife, FaceTiming. They just spent some time in Orlando at a resort. And the whole car chimes, thanks, Dad. And my children are teenagers now. Why? Because my wife expects them to thank me. It's a respect thing. Homeschool your children. There's no question about it. The enemy wants their souls, and we got to protect them. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do in order to have a wife that stays at home also. When I decided, when we decided that Colleen was going to stay home, we were over $90,000 in debt. She had the only benefits was she was a school teacher. She quit that job, and it was up to me a lowly personal trainer training people out the back of my van with trash. No future, the future was not painted pretty for me, but I had to make that decision. I think that's the decision that we have to make as men first and then enroll our women. That maybe we don't have to have all the trappings of a quote unquote good life. Maybe we don't have to keep up with the Joneses like Steve was talking about before. Maybe we don't have to have constant vacations and cars, but we will retain and save the souls of our children. We started homeschooling for the first time last year. 2020 has brought so many blessings into my life. Thank you, COVID, because it exposed the stupidity that was going on in the schools. My opinion is children don't wear masks while they're going to school. My opinion is you don't abolish phys ed and recess. You don't put plastic between the kids. But you got to understand that at the end of this 100 year reign for Satan, he's speeding things up and becoming more obvious with the cards that he's playing. And if you don't pull back and f have a sense of what the hell is going on right now, you're going to you're going to be swept away by the fear and the chaos that's unfolding. We got to make hard decisions, one of which is 
parents should be the primary educators of our children. Why would I want anybody else to raise my children anyway? Sometimes I look at these school teachers, and no knock against school teachers, but just by virtue of your stature, I say, you ain't teaching my kid. Fat, depressed, deport, uh, divorced, degenerate, dejected, miserable people, and yet I'm gonna trust my children eight hours a day with you? I don't even know your values. Have you been seeing what's going on? A bunch of crazy shit's been going on with the schools lately. Number one of which is this push towards cultural Marxism in the classroom, right? They call it critical race theory. If that's not bad enough, parents have been speaking out against it. And when the parents go to these school board meetings, what they're finding is that the FBI is, infilt FBI is infiltrating and labeling parents as domestic terrorists for demanding that their children be taught rightfully in a righteous way. We got to bring them home. Bring your wife home. Bring your child home. I see no reason why a woman needs to be out working in the world. That's my opinion. There's no reason why, even if we have to live a little bit below the Joneses standards. I see no reason why my children should be trained by strangers and the culture that's going down the toilet. Hard decisions must be made. We got to take back this world. Afford children innocence again. Man, it's so hard to keep children innocent, right? Do you see what they did, how they weaponized the media through little Nas X? Little Nas X, right? This guy blows my mind. He shows up on the scene with a very catchy tune, kind of like a, a country cowboy rap song, right? It was pretty cr clever. And all the kids are singing it. All the kids are enjoying it. And it's on uh, Sesame Street and the kids' shows. Not but a year later, this is why Satan, you see Satan works real fast right now. Not but a year later, he's giving Satan a lap dance and he's pregnant as a man. How did they get into my bedroom? How did they get into my living room? How did they get into the minds and souls of my children? The media. The way we afford our children innocence. And this is, man, I wish, you know, there's a lot of things I'm speaking about that I wish I did better. I didn't know. I didn't grow up with screens. So when screens came, I was like, oh. What's the big deal? We are literally bringing the perversion into our home every time we show our kid a screen. They have unlimited access to unlimited ideas and unlimited perversions. And then we wonder why we can't keep them straight, literally. Demonstrate faith in God. I'm not sure it comes naturally to children and even to women, I question, this reverence towards a God. You know, there's this resistance to authority. And I think that kind of is natural in the woman, and then it trickles down into the children. But I think that men operate best in authori authoritative structures. This is why we call God the Father. God is above. Why isn't God below? God is above. So if we want our children, we want our wives, we want our family to... Trust the Father, to have faith, to not freak out and become depressed and dependent, then we have to do it ourselves. We got to try to be our best ourselves. Let your children see you pray. I allow my children to know that I rest in my faith that God will make things work out well. I remind my wife and my children that everything that we get comes through the Father and that we are graced, we are blessed. We are lucky, we are fortunate. I know we live in a world where we become our own gods, and so everything that I have, I did it. Oh, I did it, look at me, I got it. I don't operate that way. We gotta show them that humility to our authority, and by demonstrating faith, we do so. So, we're starting to get a little bit more of a clearer picture, right? We start wresting authority back from Satan and delivering our families it could be, I like these 1950s paintings, by the way, you can tell, right? Kind of nostalgic about it. We could start to see a picture of the American family and the American father as it was intended to be prior to the 1950s. Let's talk about community. I'm so blessed, just once again, I didn't know what I was doing 20 years ago when I moved to Florida. 
2020 has shown us just how important it is to, number one, decide on where you're going to live based on the values of the people that are there. You can do that now. Back then, I didn't think anything of it. But at the same time, we have to consider who we're putting into the seats that rule over us, that make the decisions about us. In 2017, we had an, had an election between Ron DeSantis and a black guy, I forget his name, who ended up being uh, a coke addict and homosexual, but that's a different story. And it was teetering. I didn't know at the time that by having DeSantis be our governor here in Florida, that we would be the free republic of Florida in a world gone crazy post-COVID. I'm, I, again, once again, I'm grateful. I see the God's grace in my life, but it reminds me, and I think it should remind all of us as American fathers, talking about Americans, look at the state that you live in, look at the values of the people there, look at who they elect to the seats that, were li that govern over us, and decide whether you're going to fight and make things right, or flight and go to where it's right. I think we are seeing a balkanization of our country. The split is no longer ideological, it's, the lines are being drawn. States like Florida and Texas, maybe Arizona and some of the others, these more red states, these are states that honor, for the most part, nobody's perfect, for the most part, honor this patriarchal vision that I'm painting for you here, where we rest our power back and bring it into our homes through our fathers. Hold your state's governor accountable, guys. I don't know what the heck happened in California there, though, though, because it seemed like you guys were under the tyranny of, what's that guy name? Newsom. And you had a chance. Didn't they have a recall? And they had Larry Elder come through? Well, how did that not happen? I don't know if there's cheating going on there or what, or people are just so brain dead that they, or have Stockholm Syndrome, and they want that kind of tyranny to lord over them. I can't figure it out. But Satan's time is short. 100 years is almost up. Hold your county representatives accountable. So again, I'm blessed to live in Florida. I was living in Pinellas County, very much a liberal Marxist state, it, uh, county within the state, right? Once again, by the grace of God, I was blessed to be able to move to Lake County, where I live now, which is about 40 minutes north. Surrounded by cows and pastures, got 42 acres out there. Red as you can possibly get. Our representative in the county, Anthony Sabatini, has just, this is just an example of the kind of guy that he is. He just put forth a, I don't know what you call it, legislation. He just put forth something where he says that Florida is to become a constitutional carry state. That means not only are there going to be more bans on our ability to carry our arms, but there will be no rules whatsoever and we'll go right back to Constitution. This is the kind of man that I am happy to have be the authority in my, in my county and in my state. Listen, I think one of Satan's lies is that we need to disregard politics. And I'm not saying politics is everything, but we can see clearly that if we don't speak up and we're not, we don't hold the people accountable, that we put in the seats, particularly in our local community, that's why I'm not talking about the country. I'm not talking about the president. I'm talking about our local communities. That if we don't get involved, that it, they're somehow more spiritual. You see, you ever meet these spiritual people? They're so spiritual that they're no earthly good. You're making no good decisions to support God's kingdom on earth, but you're spiritual? It doesn't make any sense to me. We have to be active. You gotta have your feet on the ground. You gotta look around. You gotta be participating in what's going on. Number three, create homeschool communities. Once again, community is dissolved. We outsource all services to the corporation, to the government. We don't care for each other anymore. There was a time when there was homeless people, the church and the families would get together and it would help them. Now, you see homeless people, you throw your hands up because you're like, yo, just go to, the, go to the soup kitchen. Go to the state. The state takes care of everything. When we create homeschool communities, we create a safe space with common values for our children to grow up with other children with common values. 
This is a dream, of course. I'm homeschooling now. We don't have a community. We get ourselves involved in a lot of different things. But if we're to rest back our power and be the patriarchs we're intended to be, then we need to build our local communities. Even if that means, again, it's not easy, but even if it means that we got to pull ourselves up out of where we are and start over and create our own, there's still enough wide open space to do that, guys. Besides the fact that Bill Gates and the Chinese Communist Party are the two largest landowners in our country, there's still time and there's still space and we can set ourselves apart. Create community, like-minded community, like-values community, and have a faith community. All honoring the Father, all looking up, living that patriarchal order. We, gotta, we need help, we need one another, we need community. So, that picture starts looking a little bit more like Florida. Here, yeah. right? So I gotta shout that out. Country. Be patriotic. Remember I told you, when I showed you all those plans of the Frankfurt School to infiltrate all the institutions of our country through that long march, one of the things that they insisted was that there needs to be a turning of values such that people hate their fatherland. You can't, you can't expect to have a strong culture, a proud culture, people that want to work hard and sacrifice, if they hate their country, they hate their history, they hate the word patriotic comes from patriarch, to hate our fathers. To be patriotic is to be a lover of the fatherland. Be patriotic. What does that mean also too, right? Because the America that we're living in right now is more of the corporate states of America than the ideal of the founding fathers. I think that there was a grace from God in the words and the writings of our founding fathers. I think that God knew that he could establish something new and beautiful in America if it was preserved, the republic if it was preserved. But when we have critical race theory, and we have, even from when I was a kid, there was no critical race theory, but they started that idea way back in the 1950s, right? So they were slowly unfolding it. And I remember, right, because I'm a byproduct of this, this mess too, that America was stolen. You ever hear that? This is what they taught me. This is what they taught us. America was stolen. Now, let me get this right. We study history, and all throughout history, there are conquerors. And we praise the conquerors. Alexander the Great, we call him great. Dude was a conqueror. So as we look back on history, there's the conquerors and there's the conquered. But America was stolen? You gotta understand that words are weaponized. And they use these ways to subvert us and to make us think that somehow there should be no pride for the beauty that was created in this country. Look, there's winners and there's losers. That's the way it's always been. That's how we grow. That's how we evolve. That's how we are as a people on this planet. I'm kind of happy that the Europeans won. Right? I wouldn't want to be living in a teepee right now. <coughs> Preserve tradition. You know, the, they like to, the Marxists call this progress. Progress, once again, is a weaponized word to make you think that there's something good about it, right? And it's almost like a sort of a, it's, it's a mind cramp because a cell that keeps reproducing in your body is progress, right? It's giving you cancer, it's killing you, it's progress. Not all progress is good. Again, once again, I remember when I was a youth and someone would say progress, I would think of myself as a progressive. I did. But progress leads to the chaos that we're experiencing in the world right now where nobody knows up from down, girl from boy, left from right. It's all confusion. Progress equals confusion. It equals chaos. Tradition is order. It's foundational. It's righteous. It's what got us here. Seek tradition. Now, I'm not saying every tradition, all tradition, that we need to do things as they've been, you know, thousand years ago, but look to our ancestors and see and realize they weren't stupid people. We're not, and we might probably actually be dumber than them. We're not smarter than them because we live in a progressive liberal world. 
They knew what they were doing, why they did it, and it was for good reason, particularly American tradition through the Constitution. Be generative. Man, this whole YOLO attitude extends not just to the degradation of my own life and making bad decisions, but the lives of our children. We have to think, look, look, Satan knew it was going to take him 100 years. These people are patient. Uh, Antonio Gramsci called it what? The long march of the institutions. He knew he wasn't going to live to see what we got here today. These people are patient. A part of the problem is that we forget. We're so easy to adopt the new ways of doing things, the new styles, the new technology, that we live for the now when we forget the future. Live for your grandchildren. Live for your grandchildren, grandchildren. Set up a solid foundation, have hope, be generative, to generate, build generations, think long term. And pray for America. Pray for America. Ask the Father to guide us, to protect us. I don't know if we're a lost cause at this point because God unfolds his retribution and his justice when he's ready. And I'm not sure we could turn around. There was the days of Noah, and Noah was informed that, hey, I can't fix these people, I'm going to wipe them out. Catastrophe. Then there was a time of uh, Jonah. And Jonah, God spoke to Jonah and said, Jonah, tell the people to get their act together. And you know what Jonah did? It took him getting swallowed by a whale, <laughs> right? Belly of the beast. He had to go through some dark times. But he came out on the other side, and he, t he spoke up, and the people repented, and they prayed, and they were saved. I don't know if there was 1.5 billion abortions at the time, but we're way far more diabolically disoriented than the days of Noah, I would imagine. But I could be wrong. And that's not to say that your prayers aren't worth anything, but the revolutionaries fought with their pellet guns. We gotta do what we can do. We gotta do all that we can do, and we gotta ask the Father to help us for forgiveness. I ask for forgiveness every day because I'm a fallen man and I make bad decisions. I've made bad decisions. And I use that flag because it represents the idea of America, not the corporate states that we live in today. As it relates to the Father, forgive your parents, Jesse. Shout out. Forgive your parents. Forgive your parents. Christ says, if you come to the temple and you're asking me for something, you go into the Father and you have a request, you're coming to bring a sacrifice. He said, if you have something against your brother, you got something against your mother, you got something against your father, you got something against anybody, stop right there. Don't even come to me. Go and ask for forgiveness. Or forgive. Forgive. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go, because otherwise, we're going to be ruled by anger. And we're going to be operating from the same place that the people that seek to destroy us are operating from. They say you become like your enemy. So we have to drop the anger as it relates to all that this world has laid upon us. And of course, our parents are fruits of that. They didn't know. They're doing the best that they can. They're diabolically or disoriented just as much as we were. I think they did the best that they can, and if we could let go of our primary life givers, there'd be a lot more room and space for relationship with the Lord. Repent. I love this word. One of the newest words in my vocabulary. It literally means turn around. But I happen to think that this is the one thing that people just can't do. We have to admit that we were wrong. We've got to admit that we made mistakes. We've got to admit that we weren't going the right way, and then what? Turn around. But if we don't admit, if we don't acknowledge, if we don't take responsibility, there's no turning around. This story is most evidently displayed in the story of the prodigal son. There's a father. He's got two sons. One of his sons says, hey, dad, uh, give me my money and let me get out of here. He takes his money, he goes. What does he do? He blows it. He goes and lives YOLO. Hires prostitutes, gets drunk, lives the, lives the good life, right? Like most Americans, right? He goes out there. But then at some point, he loses all his money, and then he realizes, oh, man, my father has a kingdom back home. My father has good things back home. My father loves me back home. I've wasted it all. I've screwed up. 
That's the first thing he had to recognize is like, damn, I screwed up. Beautiful thing about that story, I always remember, is that as soon as he said, all right, I'm going back to my father, he turns around. You know what? His father saw him coming. If we just acknowledge we're wrong and turn around and start back towards the father, he will come back to us. He wants us to come home. But it can't happen if we don't acknowledge that we've been wrong. That's why I say acknowledge that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Be born again. What does that mean? That's the turning around process. That's from this day forth, I will aim to make better decisions, different decisions, take responsibility for, start unfolding some of the points that I laid out here for you. I can't be the old me to create a new world. I have to be completely transformed. Any spiritual ideas, Christian ideas about how to allow that to unfold in your life? Explore that. And have trust in the Father. Have trust in the Father. We are talking here today about the state of the American Father. But if the American Father has no trust in Father, then we're lost. We're a lost cause. We take our, we take our atonement with the Father and it becomes marred in the world. This is why we're so easily manipulated. Have trust, especially when things are tough. I was listening to Jesse yesterday. He was talking to a young man whose wife decides that she's not connected to him anymore and wanted to leave. One of the best things I heard my man say is, feel that pain. Be okay with the pain. Go through the suffering, but have trust, because on the other side of it, things are going to be so much better. I painted a dark picture for you. I also painted a picture for what it could be, but it ain't going to be easy. It ain't going to be light. There's going to be some pain. There's going to be some sacrifice. Be willing to go through it. Remember I said stop being effeminate. That means an unwillingness to get uncomfortable, fellas, men. This is what's required of us. This is what's expected for us. And this is the only way we can turn this boat around. Come full circle. We're in a spiritual battle. There are forces that seek to destroy us. But there are also forces that seek to help us seek to support us. I mentioned briefly that Pope Pius the 14th, 13th spoke of a vision that he had where God granted the devil a hundred years. Now some people say that hundred years began about the 1920s. That will bring us right about where we are right now. And there's this concept that as, as we get closer to the end of an age, time speeds up. You can't deny that time has sped up since 2020. We are at the peak of this battle. And so Pope Pius also learned to pray. He also started to pray a prayer. He was delivered a prayer. That's indicative of this picture that we see right here. I say give all faith and trust to the Father, but the Father also has his angels. He has his spiritual warriors to help support us in this warfare. And so he created or was revealed the prayer of St. Michael, it goes like this. St. Michael the Archangel, protect us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits that prowl around the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. That, my friends, is the state the backdrop, the vision, the expectation of the American Father. And if this is a vision that you can get behind, then join me this evening at a workshop that I'll be doing. Anthony will tell you about it or it may be on the, may be on the schedule. Where we can come together as like-minded men and start to unravel and unfold this plan to then recreate God's patriarchy on the planet. Thank you. All right, guys, if you have questions for Elliot, you can ask him over here in the back when we're, while oh, okay. he's uh, snapping photos and stuff. Uh, you wanna, we are. You want to do it over there? I can do it up here, though. You have a couple that you can. If y'all, if you guys have Yeah, okay, guys, we got a couple extra mind. minutes. If you, uh, you want to ask some questions on the mic, let's do it. Sorry, Tanner. 
Hey, Elliot. Amazing, man. Thank you. Um, love the many ideas that you're giving us. So I'm kind of curious, like, if you would take all of those many, many ideas and just um, give me, like, a few things that you would really stand up for, what, it would, what would it be? If I had to consolidate everything I just said? Yeah, like, yeah. Bro, you, I, gotta, I remind myself, and I often try to remind people, that I don't do anything of my own accord. I try to get, a, get out of the way as much as possible because I've watched how my ego can destroy things. And as a result, it's allowed me to rest more heavily on faith in the Father. So if I could say, wrap it up in one thing, which, which is intertwined with every aspect of our being, trust in the Father. All right. Yep, that's it. Thank you. That's it. That's all. I'm done. We got one more. We got one oh, more. we do? Okay, cool. I don't mind. I actually, you know, I like talking, so. I think one reason the left has been so successful is that they've turned, that a lot of Christian communities that are diverse, diverse denominations, the denominations don't work well together, but so they've been able to divide us up. How do we come together, even though we don't share similarities in how we worship the Father, but also <clears throat> stay together and uh, against the left? Well, this is my opinion, and it's based on history. There was one church, and Satan has had his plan since the beginning to divide that church. And if we want the tradition of the church, we go back to the OG church. What's the OG church? I tend to think that the Orthodox and the Catholics got it right. Martin Luther was a rebel. All we've been talking about here is how the Marxist rebels have come in and infiltrated. It's my opinion that, Marx, uh, that, that uh, Martin Luther is not to be celebrated. He, and regardless of what the history, I don't trust the history books, by the way. Regardless of what they tell us in history class, which we know is the history of the, what the Marxists want us to believe, that, uh, that somehow the church was so corrupt that it needed to be dismantled, destroyed, and then atomized, fractioned the way it is right now, as we see today, where anybody can have a church. I have a church, 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 here and here and there. There's no tradition. There's no deposit of faith. There's no lineage. There's no culture. It's whatever you want it to be. And I think that's been a part of Satan's plan. So I was baptized Catholic. I, don't, I didn't make much of it, but in my walk I've realized that Western tradition was born out of the Catholic faith. So I don't see us all getting back together and getting along. I don't know how it's supposed to be, but if I had to encourage someone, I would say look at the fathers. Remember we talking about the, fa the, the fathers of our country? Look at, look at the apostolic fathers. Look at the the OG monks and originators of the church. Try to go back to where the seed was planted. That's my opinion. Try to understand that. On that note, the past two years where the church has taken a knee to the states through these mandates. All of the churches from top Everyone. to bottom. Yeah, totally subverted. Satan is in the church. Sure. You just look at the Pope. Look at the Pope who's supposed to be the leader of the largest, Catholic, the largest Christian denomination. Look at the Protestants and how they have women preachers and, and men are feminized. Mm -hmm. I don't, listen, I love tradition, but I'm very leery of institution because it can be infiltrated as it has been. Yeah, that would be my question. With a pope calling for a church state with teeth, he wants them coming back together, right? Yeah. That's, that, that's in the future for sure. Um, can you speak to the community, that homeschool community and faith community? How do you offset <clears throat> people took the knee to the mass, to the jab, all that stuff, rebuilding that community, faith, and homeschool? How Are you, you asking separate me? from that state, that state power? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. When you're rebuilding it, right? You're rebuilding your faith community and homeschooling. 
there's going to be consequences at some point if the state and the church have teeth, right? If they're going to prosecute you or persecute for that. What do, you, what do you think was setting up for that in the future? Well, the history of the church is found in the martyrs, right? This is how you become a canonized saint, <laughs> apparently, right? So I think being willing to suffer is what's going to be required. Willing to, to suffer humbly, to fight, uh, and to not expect that it's just going to be an easy walk, you know, rainbow ride. It's going to be tough. If you, and the best way to look, the best way to sort of get a perspective on what could be expected is a great book called Live Not By Lies by Steve Draher, who uh, it's called A Handbook for Christian Dissidents. And the entire book is based on how Alexander Solzhenitsky and the, uh, and the Christians in Eastern Europe dealt with the Bolsheviks and the communists and the Marxist revolution as it was unfolding in Russia and Eastern Europe. These were tough people, and they fought back. They, did, they had to go underground, essentially. And that might be what we have to do. We, have to, we might have to go underground. Thank you. You got it, bro. Cool. All right, guys, one more time yeah. for Elliot. Give it up. Thanks, guys. What he represents is patriarchy. We're here to do work as men, as patriarchs. There's nothing more natural than being a father.